have you with us, officially in person. Great You've had here. a busy few months since we last spoke. Raising money, 300 plus customers, money grand relationship, the on-demand liquidity relationship. Talk us through it, it's exciting times. It's been a really exciting time, and I think it's demonstrative of the momentum in the overall industry, but certainly for Ripple, 2019 was an incredible year for us. We started 2020 with a lot of momentum. I think it really goes back to moving from that speculation that has driven the crypto market to utility, like solving problems for customers. And Ripple's been focused on that for a long time, and as that momentum builds, you see more and more customers come on, more and more liquidity, and that's good for everybody in the ecosystem. Why is 2020 that year, to your point, that pivotal moment where we look at the, the utility value here, perhaps, you know, and differentiate from the speculative? I think one of the reasons that 2020 will be very important is the regulatorily, that's a word, the clarity is getting better. Uh, you know, and I mean that globally. Uh, countries like Singapore and mm. Thailand Switzerland and Japan. I think the US has still an opportunity to do more there, but I think we will probably see that in 2020, and I think that helps catapult the whole industry. I also think you know, you've gone from an industry that has been a little bit in the shadows and you know, the history of crypto. Very much in the shadows. Yeah. I remember actually, I w you and I were both at Davos, and yeah. someone early on in my arrival there was like, you know, crypto is still a bad word here. I was like, uh, and it, it's a misunderstood know, word. It, it is, and I, I think a lot of what I'm doing and what a lot of what I did in Davos is meeting with regulators, meeting with very senior people at banks and explaining to them how crypto can be used, how specifically XRP can be used to solve a real problem. Not to circumvent regulation, not to circumvent you know, any government. Uh, and I think once people understand that, they very quickly become disarmed. It's no longer a bad word. Do they understand when you're talking, and, and you've sort of shifted the focus to on-demand liquidity and these cross-border transactions and facilitating faster, more efficient payments. Can they get a grip with that perhaps more than the, the rest of it? Because I think for me that's something that, particularly from my view, is they get, they get and understand. Yeah, that is absolutely the case. And even you know, in Davos, to be able to start to talk about that and put numbers on it. You know, today, last week, uh, we did $54 million of XRP flows into Mexico. That's seven and a half percent of all flow from U.S. dollar to Mexican peso. You were seven percent of the market last week, and that's up from maybe three percent in December. So this is growing very quickly. And you know, look, these are huge industries that can be made massively more efficient by using these, these new technologies. But I think it goes back to what we said earlier: like it, you have to focus on a real problem, a real customer, so, you know, dr drive that utility. Well, you know, with 7.5% of liquidity into Mexico being driven through XRP, you start to really see, okay, this is not a science experiment. There's still a lot of people, I think, in the blockchain industry who aren't familiar with the fact of how much momentum we have here. You had Alex Holmes, the CEO of MoneyGram, right. on. Yeah, I think that's an example where you know, it's one of our customers using XRP, and it's, it's working. I mean, he said, look, I was pushing him to see what proportion of the market you could become of the daily volume, and he was like, look, you know, you need a buyer, you need a seller here. So we're only limited in a sense by the number of people that are simply using the platform and available here. How quickly do you think, given that you're saying you've, you've gone from 3% to, to 7% in just a couple of months, how quickly can you scale up? Because it's a tipping point of bringing up more people onto the platform as well as anything else. Well, the great thing is, and this is true in the markets and you know, here at the NYSE, you know, liquidity begets liquidity. Yes. The more activity you see and the more people see, it, and frankly, it was great, even the, the CEO of Bitso, the largest digital asset exchange in Mexico, has been out publicly talking about some of the dynamics he's seen. And instead of being dependent upon the speculative trading of crypto as his business, he now can say, look, I have institutional flows represent, last week, just one customer through Ripple is $54 million. That's fabulous for him. You know, on a run rate, that's $2.5 billion flowing through what we call on-demand liquidity, or ODL. That's a big deal for his business, and it, you know, that brings other players that want to say, well, wait a minute, that's good. Let's, I, want, I want to be a part of that. How do you prioritize building that liquidity and your presence there versus saying, okay, now we're going to look for another corridor, another currency pair here, another country? How do you, how do you prioritize that, and what brings more customers potentially on board quicker? Well, so I, I'll, I'll dodge the question a little bit by saying it's, it's the and versus the or, <laughs> meaning uh, we definitely are prioritizing new corridors. We've talked publicly about the fact that we're in Mexican peso, yeah. Philippine peso, and Australian dollar. We've started to talk about some of what we're seeing in Brazil, uh, and we'll increasingly talk about other new corridors. I mean, the good news is we have a lot of demand, and so we'll certainly expand the other corridors. 
But that isn't to say we, we do care about liquidity using the Mexican peso as an example, and we are seeing liquidity naturally grow there because liquidity begets liquidity. And you know, market makers, whether they're you know, existing traditional market makers or crypto market makers, they see the liquidity and they realize, hey, there's an opportunity there. And so it's growing, it's growing very well. Where after Brazil? You know, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's certainly, when we look at a framework or like which countries, yeah. we want regulatory clarity. And that's key. And that's an important one. Yeah. Uh, so there are markets, I mean, any remittance market uh, that has a lot of US dollar, Euro remittances into other countries, that's a, a high priority. But if you don't have regulatory clarity, that's a challenge in those markets. You know, typically you'd say India would be high on our list. Uh, India hasn't yet provided a lot of clarity from a regulatory point of view, and so we have not prioritized. And that's key. You yeah. just you step back until you have that regulatory clarity because you yeah. waste the time. Almost. I wouldn't say we step back. We engage. Uh, you know, it means a lot of frequent flyer miles for me. Okay, uh, so you're engaging you, yes, with India for sure. And I put back to what we said about Davos. Like it's sitting down with key regulators yeah. and explaining to them, this is not circumventing a KYC, know your customer check. It's not circumventing anti money laundering checks. It's not. Once it, regulators understand you're not circumventing regulatory frameworks, they get very comfortable very quickly. And they actually, they lean in because they understand this is actually helping inclusion in the financial system. The people who are most burdened by remittance yeah. costs are those that can least afford it. And that's, you know, I think we all should care. Who's most open to this? Because I was in Southeast Asia and the, the growth in, in digitization, in payment, particularly for the proportion of the unbanked population, is so huge. Yeah. And I do feel like the regulators there are all stepping up. China is another example with, I mean, they're even talking about, you know, a yuan digital coin here. Right. Who's leading? Well, it depends a little bit how we talk about leading. I, I mean, China, to your point, it's been fascinating to see. It. I mean, they really, through mining power, control the Bitcoin blockchain. You have four miners in China that represent something like 60 plus percent of mining capacity and 80 percent of mining capacity about is based in China for both Bitcoin and Ether. So in many ways, I think China has been incredibly strategic about how they think about that. Yes. And I, I look at the U.S. and I say, hey, U.S., uh, here we are in downtown New York. We could and should, I think, do more for that clarity to allow for more investment. But you see, I think, a lot of countries around the world seeing that this is a technical wave. This is a major step, and it, they want to invest in it. They want to see companies continue to invest, and uh, I think that's good for the economy. Do you think we see, at some point in the near future, a Chinese digital coin, a Fed coin? Because the conversations are being had. Everyone's yeah. looking at this and trying to understand what it would mean for them to not be in the game here. And I know we can have the conversation about decentralized versus right. centralized and what it would mean even to have a central bank digital yeah. coin. The word However, central bank. I know, <laughs> I know we're struggling is, you know. here. However. But, well, I mean, look, I, when I step back and I think about it macro, I think it's really healthy and constructive for the entire crypto blockchain community to see central banks and central governments lean into what can these new technologies do to make our economy more efficient, our payment infrastructure more efficient, any transaction more efficient. Oh. So at large, I think it's really positive. Mnuchin was asked about this in Davos, yeah. and it, you know, it, he made a point which I think has some validity, which is the Fed window in the United States, if a bank goes to the Fed window, they're not getting a pallet, a crate of dollars, paper dollars, they're getting a digitized, centralized ledger entry. And so it's kind of like, well, what's the difference between if the central bank issues a centralized token versus what they do today, like how different is that? Now, there's some governments around the world that might, you could argue, say, well, a central bank could go direct to consumers and you could have an account with the central bank. I don't think in most of the Europe, US, you're gonna circumvent the commercial banks. Like no. that doesn't make a lot of sense. But what about you for Ripple, building a platform that could perhaps substitute XRP for a Fed coin one day or we Some think about other. the XRP ledger as an open source technology. We think about how do we make it really useful for the customers we work with. We also think about how do we make it extensible and how do we participate in that open source community in a way that makes it extensible to other types of customers. But could central banks? Sure, they could use aspects could it of that. be more efficient what they create one day? But yeah, and I th that ultimately is the underpinning I think we all focus on. How can we make this more efficient for our customers? And right now, the customers we focus on are commercial banks, payment providers. We certainly are thinking about other types of customers we could serve. 
Uh, I mean, I have made the point, I don't know if I've ever said it on air, but I've made the point that uh, in the earliest days of Amazon, it was called Amazon Books. Mm. It was a bookseller. It competed with Barnes & Noble, competed with Borders, and you know, I think about Ripple today is viewed as a cross-border payments company. We view ourselves as a blockchain infrastructure company. The first vertical we've done is cross-border payments. We wanna make sure we're winning in cross-border payments before we do another vertical, but we will certainly do other verticals leveraging these technologies. So you're open potentially in the future at some point to using the Fed coin or the one coin. I'm pushing because the head of blockchain technology at JP Morgan told me if the Fed came up with a coin, they'd dump JP Morgan coin. So I'm asking you whether you're open to the possibility of... Sure, I mean, yeah. I, I think uh, I'm very open. You know, even if the Fed in the United States is using a coin, you still have a cross-border settlement dynamic where yes. if you have central banks around the world using their uh, digital asset, I don't think it changes the need for a cross-border neutral Something settlement. in the middle, like an XRP. An XRP has been extremely efficient. I mean, look, okay. we obviously have a vested interest in that and we don't, we're not bashful about that, but XRP is extremely efficient from a technical point of view in terms of speed, in terms of scalability, in terms of cost, where I'm a Bitcoin holder, but it's not gonna solve a payments problem when the transaction time and transaction cost is you know, almost a thousand X what it is for XRP. What's going on with the price of XRP and why did Mike Novogratz weigh in on this and suggest it was going to be another bad year in 2020? You know, I think the short answer is I think Mike doesn't fully follow Ripple very closely. Uh, there's a lot He's of things he investor. wasn't uh, he wasn't aware of some of the stuff we're doing in MoneyGram. I think, you know, he, he, if he watches this, he'll be surprised to hear that we had $54 million of ODL flows last week. Look, there's a lot of experimentation. There's a lot of misinformation in this market. And I think it's uh, important to make sure that the industry is educated. And uh, it's the reason why I try to get out and make sure that we're sharing what really is going on with real customers solving real problems. You, you said you're an investor in Bitcoin. You own Bitcoin. I am, I do own Bitcoin, yes. Yeah. So XRP, is that a good investment? You know, I am going to dodge that question also. <laughs> I've seen you dodge that uh, many times. You know, look, I What's think the about investment case? I guess that's a better question. Well, I, I'm going to macro yeah. all digital assets. I have said very publicly, I think the value of any digital asset in the long term will be derived from the utility it delivers. Bitcoin utility increasingly, I think, is just viewed as it's digital gold. The gold market is a multi-trillion dollar market, and Bitcoin today is, I think, around $150 billion, $160 billion. Yes. Uh, do I think there's an opportunity for Bitcoin to appreciate as more people see it as a useful store of value. Yeah, I think so. Do I think there's going to be other digital assets that increasingly have utility for customers and therefore drive velocity, usage, people holding it, and it drives demand? Yes, I think that's likely. Will the utility value of XRP always outweigh the store of value reason for holding it in your well, mind? No, I mean, I, I think store of value is a dynamic in part. People want to hold assets that are highly liquid. You called it digital gold, though. Bitcoin, digital I, gold. Yeah, Does increasingly, XRP have that potential? I think as XRP has utility through what Ripple is doing and with the other people using XRP, I and mean, there's a bunch of other companies doing very cool stuff. I mean, a very innovative company called Coil doing interesting micropayments, particularly focused on media. Very fascinating. Yes. And so. When I look at XRP, I look at the whole. I look at what Ripple's doing, I look at what Coil's doing, I look at what Forte's doing as a gaming company using XRP. Uh, I, I look at the holistic. If there's a lot of utility and people see value in that utility, then I don't worry about it. I, I often have said, look, I don't think about the price of XRP on three days, three weeks, or three months. Over the coming years, I think that we, Ripple, are focused on driving utility from this asset, and if we're successful with that, we think that's good for the liquidity of the whole ecosystem. You're a giant, you're seen as a giant in this industry to the point where, you know, your boots at Davos get cold status, quite frankly. It's a strong It was point. cold in Davos, I, I was wearing I boots. I agree, I wear furry ones. Um, it's, the, it's the point to make here, perhaps, that there shouldn't be this battle between digital currencies, digital assets here, this belief that one currency needs to rule them all. Yeah. Actually, just greater awareness of everything that's going on uh, floats all boats here. And I mixed analogies there, but yeah. I know what I'm saying. I, look, I so passionately agree with this point. Mm. The, there is not going to be one winner in the crypto space. I, I, like, I believe that to my core. There are going to be a lot of different participants solving different segments of problems. And I, I look at what's going on in Bitcoin world, and I don't view it as competitive as what Ripple's doing. 
I look what's going on in most parts of the Ethereum community. I don't look at it as competitive as what Ripple's doing or what I see happening in the XRP community. Uh, I want to see all boats rise. I think if that all boats rise, if the market cap of all digital assets grows, that's good for everybody. Uh, and I, I think ultimately we all need to focus less on what, you know, throwing stones and more on like, let's solve customer problems. Let's see scale through solving problems and then I think it'll take care of itself. Talk to me about the raising of money and the $10 billion valuation. How do you feel about that? You know, I think any time you have new investors come in, you know, you uh, are intimidated by the expectations that are set. <laughs> by the same token, you know, Ripple today at today's XRP price owns something like 15 plus billion, I think somewhere north of $15 billion worth of crypto. So in some ways, those it's investors came in at a discount. <laughs> Look, uh, uh, we are in a very fortunate position of a very strong balance sheet. We're a very fortunate position to have a lot of customer momentum. And I think it's because we've focused on solving a real problem for real customers. So why IPO? Why go public, to your point, if you have this money, you're raising money? What's the purpose of, of going public? Well, I don't think we've said we're going bell. to go public. I think what we've <laughs> said, uh, what I said was, I think 2020 will likely have crypto kind of blockchain oh. IPOs. And I think what I said was, you know, I don't think Ripple will be the first, but we certainly don't want to be the last. So I kind of kept it open-ended. I think people heard of something a little bit different than that. but. Look, it, the balance sheet flexibility we have had has given us the ability to invest over $500 million yeah. across the blockchain ecosystem. That includes you know, within XRP world, uh, but also beyond that, because again, back to the, I think all boats can rise. So I think having balance sheet flexibility gives us strength to do new things. The MoneyGram deal, the deal I know you're very familiar yes. with, where we invested about $50 million into MoneyGram. Uh, and so, we want to continue to have the flexibility to grow the business. Uh, you know, we've added, you know, well, more than 150 employees last year. At a time when I think others who have been less focused on solving real problems, there's been a bunch of layoffs in the crypto community over the past, you know, even few weeks. And you know, we're going to continue to grow. We want to make sure we have the balance sheet flexibility to do that. So it would be about more money and about potential acquisitions and, and doing. Yeah, doing I think it as flexibility more than just more money. And I, I, maybe yeah. I'm parsing words a little bit, but. You know, today we have a $10 billion valuation as a private company with a private security. You, you, we have shareholders of Ripple. Uh, you know, if you're a public company, you have a little more flexibility in the type of deals you might look at. You mentioned something there which I think is important. I just want to go through it, the court case, over whether or not XRP is a security or not. Any clarity coming in the near distant future is one of the questions that I know the community would like to know. Yeah, I, yeah this is an area where I think we'll continue to engage. Uh, I, I think from my point of view, the good news is we've had very constructive conversations with regulators here in the United States. We'll continue to do that. And I, I think it's clear to me that there's an opportunity to provide more clarity and we're working to achieve that. You know, I was looking at the uh, market cap of MoneyGram and I know you've got uh, stronger views on this. Just to your point about money, about acquisitions, about expansion, would it ever be worth perhaps acquiring a MoneyGram or do you risk perhaps upsetting other partners and competitors of theirs actually yeah. that, that trade with you or, or do business with you? We definitely don't, be, we don't want to be in the business of competing with our customers. No. We want to partner with our customers. And uh, you know, I think we obviously are a shareholder in MoneyGram, but also a shareholder in a number of other companies in the space. And yeah, you know, it's because we want them to be healthy and strong. I mean, Bitso, which is really the, the yeah. leading South American, Latin American exchange, we're an investor there. Uh, and we want to see them grow and thrive because they are really good at what they do. And as they grow, we can help them grow. That's good for us, it's good for them. Fast forward five years, where are you? Well, I think the overall crypto community will continue to grow at really impressive rates. And five years from now, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know exactly how to think about that, but I, I think within crypto world, I, I think Ripple will continue to grow and take market share. Uh, but that will probably be, you know, we're focused on cross-border payments today. I think we'll look at other use cases, as I kind of alluded mm -hmm. earlier. And, you know, I hope that in five years we've got a, uh, we're not just Amazon books, but we are uh, Amazon. And fast forward one year. Ooh. <laughs> kind of tougher. <laughs> it's probably another cold, rainy day in New York somewhere. Uh, are you public? You know, I, I, I don't <laughs> want to put a timeline on it only because, look, it, it probably depends on lots of macro dynamics. Cool. I mean, you know, to, on a more somber note, you've watched what's happened with coronavirus and these things. And like, it's hard to put exact timelines. I think 
we want to have the flexibility to be a public company when it's right for Ripple to be a public yeah, company. Yeah, I can see you're enthused. You get a sense when you talk to, you know, creators of businesses that that is something that's sort of part of the plan. And yeah, I, I, I think, think it's part of the journey. I mean, yeah. there's kind of a meme in Silicon Valley, almost an anti-public thing where companies have waited, waited, and waited. And I, I, I'm of the mind that, you know, look, it can be a very constructive step. Although I've also said inside the company, you know, people talk about the IPO as an exit. I'm like, no, 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 an IPO is a beginning. Yeah. It's not an exit. It's, it's a step in the journey. A financing event is a step in the journey. You know, I, I always am a little bit uh, quizzical when I see some of these companies go public and they you know, have these huge celebrations. And it's like, look, that, that's when now expectations just went begins. up. I mean, you <laughs> asked me about a $10 billion valuation, yeah. like the public company is even more like, on the center stage, and that's when the hard work, I mean, I, yes, we're working hard now, but it only ups the ante. Give me this, XRP, higher or lower in one year time? <laughs> had to ask. Depends on so many things. <laughs> I, I knew you'd dodge that. <laughs> Great to chat to you. It's really nice to talk to you, Likewise. thank you. Thank you.